So today is Wednesday, April 19th. We are just one day away from going to London Marathon this weekend. Yeah, less than 100 hours yeah. till uh, London Marathon. How are you feeling? Yeah, pretty good. I was just working on my calf. I've got this sort of minor calf pain which has randomly popped up. Um, and this has uh, been pretty helpful in relieving it. So thanks to Bob and Brad who sent this across. Um, yeah, I know plenty of people that have been using massage guns, but I generally, genuinely have found this quite helpful. Um, but in general, uh, yeah, I mean, after Osaka, uh, what was it, seven and a half weeks ago now, I wasn't really sure um, what it would be like to try and back up eight weeks later after such a big training block. Um, but I was pretty confident that one down week would be enough, especially given, um, I've shared this in previous videos, that in Osaka, I, when I get these muscle cramps, I don't, I don't want to talk about cramps <laughs> much in this video, you're not able to really completely empty the tank because you're managing the muscle fatigue. So I wasn't able to um, push myself 100%. And so I felt like I was fairly well recovered about four to five days later. Mm. And uh, I knew after one week, I did a training run. I think I did a 36K run, maybe nine or 10 days after Osaka. And I knew then I was going to be okay um, in terms of recovered from Osaka moving forward into, into London. Um, and yeah, I mean, the last six weeks of training has been really, really good. Um, yeah, we'll go through all that soon. But in general, um, I'm definitely no, I'm definitely not any, uh, I'm definitely as fit or fitter than leading into Osaka uh, based on all training indications. So yeah, looking forward to Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it's been really cool to kind of see it all about but how have you found the back-to-back -back marathons in just eight weeks yeah i think i think if you rewind pre-super shoes it's difficult to back up eight weeks you know from one marathon to the other um that's if you want to run well i mean you could easily do two marathons eight weeks apart and have <laughs> a month off after the first one and then do a short training block but i'm obviously trying to break my pb in both um, being 220, uh, 46. And yeah, I found it okay. I, I'll be honest, towards the end of these last couple of weeks, I've felt like I really would like to have some time off um, just because I've been, you know, really thrashing myself in training for, what is it? 10 week block leading into Osaka, 12 week block, block really. And now, you know, five months. Um, definitely keen to have some time off after this, but uh, I would do it again. And I actually said to myself at the end of last year, that I would actually prefer to have two marathons in every season, fall and, uh, and you know, spring, uh, yeah, April, March, April, and then September, October, November, because it sort of gives you two shots at running a good time, as opposed to building up to, for just one attempt where the weather might be bad or you might just be sick or whatever. Um, so I'd definitely do this again, um, but uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the weekend, but I'm also looking forward to taking some, I would say at least a month of uh, very unstructured training I'll, I'll keep running but it'll probably be very low mileage and there very well may be a period of one or two weeks where i don't run at all would you say that's more of a physical or a mental break that you would like oh yeah good question both equally 150 50 mm -hmm. um probably more physical actually really if i if i think think about that question more i'd say more that when i think about when i ran 220 i've shared this on different podcasts and stuff i actually had almost six weeks it was five and a half weeks completely off four months before that and then I trained for three and a half months and ran 220 and that really taught me that you can get fitter you can get fit faster than you realize provided no setbacks no injuries or uh, illnesses and so I have no doubt I'm deciding to do a marathon which I'll uh, talk about um, in another video or another podcast uh, in October and then probably in December mm -hmm. and so when I think about it three months you know, 12 weeks before that first marathon in October is July June so I don't really see much point in thrashing myself between now and the start of that block, really, because I know that in 14 weeks, I can get into near PB shape or PB shape, so provided no setbacks, that is. Yeah. Okay. So, like you said, today's Wednesday. We're leaving to go to London tomorrow. How, how are we feeling about our goal on Sunday? Yeah, the goal. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I, you know, I'm definitely shooting for, for a sub-220. Um, with that said, there's, you know, last time I did this series, um, and there was all this debate about did you go out too fast and if you're trying to break to uh, 220 why would you go out in 68 high or six, I think I was 6904, 6902 or something like that. Um, one thing that's kind of completely forgotten about when 
you go through that analysis of like the pacing is, and this was in a way discussed on the weekend in Boston with Kipchoge. He led the whole thing and people speculate whether or not that was a good idea. He burnt too much energy. There's no point, I don't think, if you're trying to run as fast as you can running it alone. And so you're a little bit um, con constr restricted to where the packs are and where people are for you to join to make that race easier for you as long as far as, far into the race as you possibly can. So when I ran 220, I was fortunate to have a Canadian runner called Lee. Um, he, he was a better athlete than I was uh, in terms of PBs going into the race for 10K half and full. I ran with him to almost 30K. And uh, once he dropped, he ended up running 216, he closed really fast. As soon as he dropped me at about the 29k mark, everything became much harder for me from that point. I was on pace for 218 low until about 39 or 38k. Um, and so I'm not going to just go out there and run 70 flat on my own. I'm going to go out at 320 per k pace for 3 to 4 to 5, 3 to 5k and then try and assess where the packs are, where people are to join because I'm never going to run 219 on my own the whole way. Mm -hmm. That's it's, it's very difficult for anyone to run a PB or a really fast time completely solo. So I'm going to look out for where the packs are. And if they are going a little bit quicker than 70, I'll go with that. Or if there's one going slightly slower than 70, then I'll go with that. So it's it's one of those things that I think, you know, a couple of people sort of said, oh, when you're trying to break 220, why would you go out in 69.04 in Osaka? Well, there was no one behind me for, for a while. The next pack was 71, I think, or 70 high. So I'm not just going to sit on my own in between packs and run solo. I think if I did that, that would end up being a slower time for sure in the end. I'd get to 30k mentally and physically fatigued. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so definitely shooting for a PB. There's no reason why I can't run one given, you know, training's been going very well. Uh, definitely doing workouts better than I was before I ran 220. Um, so yeah, we'll see where the packs are at and, uh, and where people are to join and we'll take it from there. But the forecast looks pretty good. Looks like it's going to be about 10, 11 degrees, maybe a little bit windy, but... Um, Otherwise, temperature-wise, it's pretty good. Yeah, I like that you actually said that because you even during Boston, you saw Kipchoge asking those to kind of pick it up and run with him. Yeah, I mean, he shared yesterday in an interview that he had a, something wrong with his leg. Um, you know, maybe. I mean, he wasn't limping in the race or didn't show any indication of that in the race. Um, a lot of people wonder why he led the whole way and did all the work. You know, that's the real thing. For anyone that's run a marathon alone um, the whole way knows that it's much harder to do it that way. Uh, it's partly psychological, mm -hmm. um, it's partly, well it's probably mostly psychological, Ugh, I don't really know the science there, but um, yeah, anyone that trains in a group knows that when they when they do workouts with other people that are as good as them, especially if they sit behind them, um, or on the shoulder of one, it's, it's, it's just easier by one or two percent. So that's what I'm looking for to try and coast as long as I can mm -hmm. with someone until I realise that's not working anymore, whether they go ahead or they drop back. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things I've learned over... 12 marathons now that that's a pretty big deal I think um, not just going at it going at it alone it's, it's very hard to do that and, and I don't have confidence that I can run 219 on my own so okay cool that makes sense yeah. uh, would you care to kind of go into what have you done in training between now and then yeah so it was 8 weeks between Osaka and London and after Osaka, I had one week off. I didn't have it completely off. I ran a couple of times with some friends, purely social runs, unplanned. Um, I think it was twice. And then I started a six week training block before this last week, which is a taper week, which I, you know, you don't really include that as a week of training, honestly. It's sort of just easing down, doing easy runs. Um, I did a lot, a lot of, uh, some would say controversial things or different things in this last six weeks, um, purely out of interest, just to see how I would respond to it. Um, when I shared that I suffered from the cramping um, in Osaka again, um, uh, a lot of people reached out with different opinions and ideas and, and the ones that I, I felt most conf confident in were doing longer runs and strength training and hill sprints. And I've done all three of those things. So I've done one 45 kilometer run. Uh, it was about f five and a half weeks ago now. So that's uh, 28 miles, I think, or close to that. Um, not overly hard. I think the pace was 4.10 or 4.15. So around three hours, I think I went through the marathon in 2.57 or something. I didn't. Actually, I actually had a couple of stops. Uh, it was in Berlin when I was working uh, on a Nike project with the Berlin Track Club. Uh, we cruised around Berlin and did a, did a 45K run just to, you know, 
there, there's evidence to show that the that, that can help the the strength and there's all these all this science about uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you what that exactly <laughs> how that exactly works but people have had success in doing uh, extended long runs to, to help their cramping um, the hill sprints I've done more or less twice a week uh, every week except this last 10 days I got told to maybe pull back on them uh, now anything all out uh, so I've been doing five to ten uh, short sprints of around 10 seconds up a hill uh, that's supposed to activate glutes and hamstrings in a slightly different way to, to improve the power and speed. So uh, I've tried that. And then I've been doing some very basic strength work. Not in the gym, uh, purely because the travel is very difficult for me to get to gyms. Mm. Uh, that's a bit of a lazy excuse, honestly. But um, I just, you know, it, it's the small thing. Like when you go to a gym, they try and get you to sign up for 12 months. And I'm only ever in a place for like a week or two. So then I'm paying daily fees of 25, 30 bucks. It just gets really expensive. So I've been using mostly bands. Um, and doing the Nordic hamstring uh, curls with, with your help room, um, holding the feet and, and lowering down to, to put pressure on the hamstrings. So yeah, we'll see if that helps. Um, the other thing I did, which was controversial and got a few podcasts talking, uh, was um, the marathon I did four weeks ago in Hanover. So I ran a marathon uh, in training, last super long run four weeks before. I was always going to do a uh, you know a very long run on that weekend four weeks before and I was always going to do 40 to 42k I noticed Hanover was an hour and a half by train away from Berlin where we were uh, so I went in there thinking I just want to run this at a sub maximal effort you know around 90% effort uh, and I had no idea what that meant in terms of a pace I just wanted to run it to effort I found out on the start line that the women's front field were going uh, through halfway in 72.30 my gut feel was that was a little bit too fast for what I thought would be good for me but I thought when we took off, again, I had a glance back, I sat behind them for the first 2K and there was sort of nothing behind me. So I thought, well, I don't really want to run this whole thing on my own. Um, so I just went with them and thought I can always pull back after 5, 10K. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole way felt very comfortable. I ended up running, uh, yeah, 223, 50 something. Um, yeah, there was a few different opinions about that. Uh, one podcast doubted that I did it at 90%. Um, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got back straight back into training uh, the next day. So um, if, if it was 100%, then it um, would have been tough to return to training straight away. But um, yeah, I, it was a really good uh, exercise for me. And I, was, I, was, I, I, did, I did cheat in a way that um, I had carbs on demand. I had Reem on the bike the whole way that handed me uh, drinks and carbs. Like, that's not really allowed, but for me, it was a training run. So that was a definite advantage, which I won't have at London. Um, but at the end of the day, I was just pure, I was mostly doing that to ensure that my recovery was going to be good. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like that was an 85 to 90% effort run. Um, I was a bit surprised to see the time. Uh, so sorry for clarity too. I, I ran with that pack until 32 K and then the last 10 K, I just went a little bit quicker to run around 219, 220 marathon pace in the last 10 K. And, uh, I'd definitely do it again. I think it was really good for me. Uh, no cramps at all, not even after the race. I was really surprised about that. I was in a weird way expecting them in the last 5K to sort of come. And a part of me was thinking, well, if they do come, at least I'm going to learn how to handle them. I mean, I've, I've had plenty, plenty of times that I've had to figure that out as well. But at least I thought, well, in this occasion, it's not really going to matter because I don't really care for my end result, my mm -hmm. end time. Um, it's more about doing the distance. So yeah, it, it worked out very well, no cramping. Um, yeah, I think my mileage has sort of been right around that 130 to 145 K, uh, that sort of 80 to 90 miles, um, all the way through to last week. I think last week was slightly less and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for the weekend. Uh, uh, yeah, again, it, it, it just really depends on where people are and where the packs are as to, as to how fast I run. And if I, if I end up, you know, having no pack to run with and having to go through in 70 high and then close a little bit faster and run 221 or 220, you know, I'll be happy with that. But I, I just want to run a race that I'm proud of and ideally I want to try and finish without cramping. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and I mean, I've heard the crowds there. It's really good. So hopefully if there's no pack towards the end, you'll be able to use those energy. That is going to be an, a big uh, a big deal, I think, too. Yeah, to have crowd the whole way. It's funny how those things work mentally. Um, just the smallest things like having crowd. I mean, that's not a small thing. It's a big thing. But um, it really helps um, just to have people cheering along, even if you have no idea who they are, which, of course, I won't have any idea who the who, who almost everyone is. Uh, got a couple of friends out there watching um, watching the race. But... 
um, yeah, looking forward to it for sure. Um, like I said, I think if things go to plan and a pack goes through in 70 flat or 69 high, um, I definitely think, and I can avoid the cramping, I think I can run a, a good solid PB. But um, I think anyone that's run a bunch of marathons know, knows now that, uh, yeah, everything going to plan is, um, it, it's tough. It's tough yeah, to, for, for, for the stars to align, it's, it doesn't often happen. Yeah. yeah. You also did a test just about a week ago, I think? Yeah, so I did a lactate test uh, in London last week. I was invited up by um, Anthony Fletcher from One Track Club. Uh, we did a lactate test to see where all my values are at, and it was exactly where I thought uh, it would be. My predicted marathon time based on my lactate values and my paces and my heart rates all aligned. Um, we're going to show you uh, some footage from that shortly. Um, predicted 220, I think it was 220.12 or 220 low. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was based on how I would run that day, I think. Uh, but at the end of the day, predictions are predictions, it's nothing um, really. But it's good to know where my thresholds are. In certain zones here. Uh, but the interesting thing you're interested going to be looking for is marathon pace prediction. So we're looking at it right now, based on this test today, and how we've been presented, 2.20.12. <laughs> that's a small PV, by the way. Yeah, well, there we go. By about 30 seconds. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of like, and this is where it does become a little bit of like a pinch of salt. Right. In that, okay, yeah, we've predicted that based on this measurement, but on the day it could be different. And yeah. The adrenaline of the day, the uh, busy of being with a pack, the mental side of it is all conducive to you know, putting more in, but also some other putting less in. So, pinch of salt. Right. With that. However, the really, really interesting thing for us is we basically uh, labelled that lactate threshold, that first rise, around about 17.5 kilometres an hour. Yep. So if you basically were on that, you're like, yeah, I can feel it starting to change now. Yep. Um, so heart rate wise, we're looking at anything like easy, anything below that uh, is 326 and below. Yep. So slower than 326 per kilometre or 531 per mile. Um, heart rate wise, 152 is kind of where we're looking at. So we weren't too far from your prediction at the beginning of 160. Um, so that's kind of where we would say RP4 is like a really good gauge of like, okay, where am I right now? Different parts of the course obviously changes. You get a bit of a hill coming along, you're going to spend more, then downhill you're going to save more, so it's going to be one of those little averages conversations over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you, in, in regards to your goal, uh, we're pretty much exactly, <laughs> yeah. where, you know, exactly where we are. In 13 seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, does that factor in things like tapering? You know, no, so it's, no. it's literally where you are right now. Because I'm in heavy, yeah, I'm very tired exactly. at this point. As in, like, yeah. where you should be two weeks out. So yeah. that's good to know. I was wondering that, like, is that a case of what you would be predicted to run today in a heavy load, or what you would be predicted to run if you do do a taper and you ease down? Yeah, so it's kind of like a, we, we, we've calculated a percentage of your lactate threshold yeah. pace wise, and then what that would mean for the full distance. Right. So based on where you are right now. Right. So in this fatigued state, we see that there's potentially room for that that exactly. number. However, tapering and uh, refreshing and getting all those things in place, hopefully we then we start to crack through those barriers. Nice. Yeah, other things that I've incorporated into the last little block, um, I've been using ketones a lot in training and in general uh, we've had some collaboration with HVMN, uh, the ketone uh, company based in the US that's recently been working with Sarah Hall and some other endurance athletes. Huge fan, honestly. Um, I've heard I wouldn't say I've heard mixed things about ketones in general from different people. I've heard mostly positive, but ketones are a completely different energy fuel to carbs. Um, the The idea of, of generating ketones in the blood can only, up until five, ten years ago, um, was only able to be done via fasting and, and entering ketosis. So completely running out of carbs, having your fat stores, you know, um, work for energy. Uh, I'm not the best person to, to explain this, but... Um, ketones are a way to activate the ketones in the blood, uh, uh, you know, without fasting. And I've found it to be really beneficial for just a sustained energy source mm -hmm. through the day, uh, mostly mental than physical. Um, yeah, I think when you drink a can of energy drink, you sort of feel it in your body as well as in your brain. Whereas this is definitely both, but it's more, more mental than anything. So yeah, massive thank you to HVMN who have been, um, uh, allow me to test this product out and we're doing a, quite a lot of content with them actually in the, in the near future. Um, very excited to also share that uh, we've recently partnered with Garmin and uh, I've been um, trialling out the 965. Um, yeah, the touchscreen is um, really cool. Uh, I found that the, the GPS is 
slightly more accurate as well on the track at least. Uh, that was one thing that previous Garmin's were a little bit off with. Uh, I know um, some other brands have had some track modes. I think the Garmin 965 is more accurate on the track. I've sort of tested that here in P Portugal. Um, but the screen is, yeah, it's really cool. And um, yeah, huge thank you to Garmin. We've actually recently changed over to using Garmin Clipboard in uh, at the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy as well from Training Peaks. Um, I found that analyzing, when I'm in Garmin Clipboard, people that are syncing their, their watches over, which 95% of us are with Garmin, um, to be able to read the data and splits is way more clear in the clipboard um, and it's also it's also free so um, yeah definitely recommend Garmin clipboard for for coaches and athletes um, they're improving it rapidly all the time that it's, it's it's still it's still very well uh, you know in the works so I think that's going to be a big big thing for them moving forward and um, yeah really excited to, to try more Garmin products moving forward but um, yeah um, it's been really cool to, to test out and collaborate with those brands over the last uh, little block and um, I'm super interested to see, especially HVMN with the ketones, I think that that's going to be a, a, also a really big, not, not only for HVMN, but I think in the industry as a whole is going to be mm. huge in five to ten years. It's sort of just really still very new. So, and you've yeah. been using the massage gun as well, I've seen. Uh, you know, I've actually had um, companies send me, uh, send us uh, massage guns before, and I'll be brutally honest, I haven't actually used them before. I've normally just used them once or twice and found it unuseful. But for whatever reason, this time I've actually stuck with using this one, especially through my calves through here. And I've just found that it's loosened up my Achilles and calves really well mm -hmm. if I've got this little nozzle on it here. So yeah, once again, thanks Bob and Brad for sending this over. Um, uh, yeah, I this one's actually stuck with me for some reason. I think it's uh, I think it's just also because it's a little bit lighter than the previous ones as well, so traveling with it's not annoying. Um, mm -hmm. Other ones I've tried have just been a bit bigger and a bit heavier. Uh, and so when you've only got so much luggage space, like we're on the road all the time, this is just a bit easier to use. So, so yeah, oh, another thing actually, another shoe I've really liked from, um, from top running our partner um, is the Adios Pro 3. Uh, I've been using this in training. Honestly, I'm tempted to use these on Sunday, uh, but I just, I'm still, I'm still going to go with the, um, the, the Vaporfly 2. Uh, I still haven't tried the 3. I was in Berlin uh uh, with Berlin Track Club, you know, shooting the three, but um, I've had a, I've had the most luck with cramping with the two, as in the cramps have come, they've been smaller and hit me later in the race, and and, and in Hanover when I ran uh, that training run marathon uh, four weeks ago, I wore the Vaporfly two, and no cramps, and so, yeah. I think I'm just going to stick with with what I am most confident in, but. Um, if for whatever reason they fell apart the day before and I lost them, I would be very comfortable running in these. Um, I've really liked, uh, yeah, training. I've basically done all my training in these, mostly because the Vaporfly 2 I've worn so many times, I don't have to um, really uh, feel like feel comfortable. Um, I don't have to train in them to be comfortable in the race. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy just to line up with them, but definitely recommend these. Thank you, Top, for running, for allowing me to try these. And uh, yeah, we're trying quite a few more shoes in the next um, few months to, to share my thoughts as well. Exciting, exciting yeah. information here. Um, I guess the big question that everyone always kind of looks into themselves and everyone asks each other is like, what's after London? So yeah, after London, I'm having a short holiday. Um, haven't had a, a proper holiday for a while. I'm going home to Australia on the Gold Coast for about a week and a half. And then I'm heading over to the US, uh, Flagstaff and Boulder to do some uh, content with some athletes over that way. Uh, I don't want to share names yet, but there's some big names coming uh, back on the channel and there's some new faces. Um, triathlon, it's probably no surprise to people that that's a big focus for us moving forward. So, <coughs> um, some triathletes based in, uh, in Arizona are going to be on the channel soon. And then Eurotrip, really excited about Eurotrip. That is a race uh, set up by the indie runner that goes from, so that's like um, the, uh, the race in the US that goes from Vegas to uh, LA, the speed project. Uh, it's the European version of that. It's only in, its, I think it's only its second year, or maybe it's its third year, so it's still very new. And every year it changes which city it goes from and to, and this year it's from Cologne in Germany to Strasbourg in France. I think it's about 350 kilometers. It could actually be a little bit more. Um, and we have a very solid team of eight, uh, sponsored by On Running and Precision Fuel and Hydration, 
and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. I think it's obvious that I'm not going to be uh, training very hard for that because that's actually going to be my break leading up to that. But uh, it's a relay with eight people. We're going to do legs of five to ten k throughout the 350 k, and uh, got a couple of good friends um, lining up with me in that race. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's that's June second to June fourth. Very thankful for uh, the sponsorship from On Running and also from Precision Fuel and Hydration that are going to be um, fueling us throughout that weekend. And we're going to do a couple of videos on the weekend as well to show you what it's all about, to do something a little bit different in um, terms of a overnight relay running through the middle of Europe in the forest to try and get from one city to another. It'll be really cool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very exciting. We're totally looking forward to it. I know myself, it's some, a, a relay itself with a bunch of people. It sounds like a bunch of fun. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matt. We are so looking forward to seeing what happens. I know I am especially keen to see how well you do. I was there with you when you did the Hanover Marathon, and it was, I kept waiting to see, you know, three Checking months on you were cramping. No, I mean, <laughs> you look so comfortable. I've, I've biked along with you a lot of the times, and I kept thinking, is he going for it right now? I don't want to ask him, like, throw him off his game, but the cramps aren't coming in, and he looks pretty solid, yeah. so... I wouldn't say you were going hard at all. We were having a conversation even at some point. Yeah, we had a bit of a chat with a K to go, I think. I think that's when I realized I was in a run 2.23. I honestly just didn't really think about the time that much. I just wanted to run and think about my effort. I was lucky to join those people for 32K, so I was yeah. chatting with um, with a couple of guys pacing for a while. So Yeah, if anyone yeah, was, was really watching fun. along, you were just having fun with the cameras. And yeah, it was on the German friends. TV, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I would say that would very well, so... I can't even imagine. I think the Vaporflies is a good go for you. Mm. The Alphas maybe work. I know someone suggested that that was probably... Yeah, some people suggested that, that the Alpha Flies might be the reason for the cramping. Uh, it's definitely the sole reason. Yeah. Uh, and it's also definitely not caffeine. I said this on an Instagram oh, yes. post. Um, because in Hanover, I for just experimenting. I experimented, experimented with having a lot of caffeine mm -hmm. during and before. Um, no real reason, just wanted to try it out. I had a lot of Monster Energy drink before and during, which has very high levels of caffeine. Zero sign of cramps. So there was a lot of people indicating that it might be caffeine. Kind of debunked that now. Yeah. Um, but uh, Alpha Flies, Vapor Flies, at first I dismissed that idea that it's the shoes. I just thought, surely not. But, yeah, I mean, every race I've run on the Alpha Flies, I have cramped much earlier than Vapor Flies. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we're yeah. definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens, guys. Cool. Keep team. Let's, let's give it a go. <laughs>